One of the things that Dr. Montessori was well known for was her focus on the children's physical health. A lot of times in my experience in the current modern Montessori community, that emphasis gets discounted a little bit. Now, if you've read some of Montessori's earlier books, you will know that she measured the children fairly regularly. She gives uh, references to a piece of apparatus that the children would have their height measured with, and I believe she measured other aspects of their body, some of their proportions and things as well. And I'm not suggesting that that is something that you have to go toward. What I am talking about is more the idea of the habits that do create good health in children need to be an emphasis in modern Montessori schools. And the first one I'm going to talk about, not surprisingly, is diet. Uh, one of the things that I have found is that there is a wide range of approaches to this in different schools across the United States. And I have a little bit of a sense of, of schools in other parts of the country because of my participation in the online Montessori community. It's really important that we realize that this is a grave threat to our children today. The amount of sugar that our children uh, take in, the amount of fats, um, I'm going to just say the amount of empty calories that they take in is a real detriment to their health. And it's something that we as Montessori parents, Montessori professionals need to put our attention on. Now, there's a couple of different ways that, that I suggest that we do this. One is personal education. Uh, there's been a lot of talk in the holistic health community over the last several decades about the fact that medical doctors, at least a few years ago, did not have very good education in the area of nutrition during their medical school time. And given how important that is to the health of our country, that's, that's a real difficulty. One of the things that I appreciate most about uh, the doctor who was the family practitioner for my family for decades is that he did emphasis, did put an emphasis on that, put an emphasis on nutrition both with food but also with, with supplements. Now I'm not going to go into supplements and those kinds of things because mostly I'd like to address this in the framework of a Montessori school environment or a Montessori homeschool environment and how we can encourage good eating habits within those kinds of communities. First, I do think some school policy on refined sugar in snacks, in even lunches that are brought to school or lunches that are provided for the children at school is an important policy to put in place. Now, even though this is about health, and I don't believe that there's very much controversy over the next few things I'm going to say, please recognize one of the things you must do if you're going to be successful with this is to get buy-in from your community. This is not the kind of thing to just impose on an established community. If you take the time to educate your parents, if you take the time to listen to your parents, if you find out what their concerns are, why are their children's lunches filled with things like Lunchables? If you're not familiar with this American product, it's it comes in a little box and it's got all kinds of little uh, compartments in the box and there might be some lunch meat here and some crackers here and some cheese here and a cookie here but the the main appeal besides the fact that it's filled with salty sweet foods that children will tend to eat pretty readily is that you just buy it at the American grocery store and you put it in the lunch box and it's it's ready to go so I want you to recognize that even though I feel like that there are some principles that, that are very appropriate and that should be emphasized and put in place and made a part of, of, of a, a more prepared environment for the children, you need to involve the adults that will be participating in this. So your parents, your staff, if you have other um, people that are in association with your community, if you've got volunteers, this is something that everybody needs to kind of get on board with. And also, there needs to be some understanding that people are going to have different views. So one of the policies that I believe is most successful that I've seen put in place at a school is a no candy, no soda pop policy. 
there's very little controversy that these are healthy foods. <laughs> if anything, these are party foods, these are fun foods, but there's very little chance that somebody's going to say, this is helping my child's health. The second reason that I think that this is a good policy is it's very distinct. Um, soda pop is soda pop, and there's if, if you do have children bringing energy drinks and other things with high sugar, you may need to refine it down a little bit more if you can, but everybody knows soda pop has sugar or artificial sweeteners and carbonation, and that's what a soda pop is. Everybody knows what a candy is, pretty much. It's not a cookie, it's not a dessert, it's not a homemade um, something. It's packaged things that are like chocolate and hard candies and, and things like that. So that's one of the reasons I think this is a policy that can be clear and unambiguous and that it can be something that most people can get on board with, especially if you take time to educate them, get their input and, and their understanding. And one of the ways that I have found some parents who maybe feel like this is a non-issue or why can't I you know, put some candy in my child's lunchbox, that's one of the ways that I you know, tell them I love them in the middle of the day, why can't I do that? One of the things that I've found can help these parents get on board with this kind of policy is to talk to them about the whole school community, to talk to them about the children who are dealing with obesity, to talk to them about the children who maybe because of the way that their bodies process sugar have real behavior and learning problems when these kinds of foods are part of their day. If these things are addressed in a, a community-wide, let's understand each other, let's come to this agreement together kind of approach, I found it to be very, very successful. So that is, is kind of the overreaching nutritional piece that I would suggest that you look toward particularly if you're a school that has a lot of food coming in from outside, either parents that bring snacks on a rotating basis or the children bring their own lunches into your school, this kind of thing can be really important. Because if you've got parents that are attempting to send really, really healthy lunches and then children are um, seeing other people's lunches and it, it just, it's, it's a real good policy from, from my point of view. Now, the other thing with nutrition that I, I think it's important for people to realize is that there are countries where it is just the expectation that whatever food is put in front of a child, that's what that child is going to eat. In the United States, this is a little bit of a foreign idea. Now, I believe that we need to be respectful of the child, and not only respectful, we need to teach that child to pay attention to their inner signals. So my grown sons both eat a wide variety of foods, and one of them seems to be very happy to eat any kind of healthy vegetables, whatever that I serve when he comes over to my house, but raw tomatoes are not something he will eat in any way, shape, or form, and that is just his own body's experience. Happens to be the same for, for his father. So there are things that we need to respect even if it is a, um, a healthy food and, and it seems like a child is being arbitrary. Or, I mean, I haven't found tomatoes to be something that many children don't like. I found them to be a pretty popular vegetable. But this is one of those things that we need to respect. We don't force foods on children. One of the things that I enjoyed most in the videos that Margaret Humphrey did was when she talked about how we work with children, how we work with young children on trying new foods. And we eat with them and we talk about, oh, I've not had this in a while, or oh, it looks like this is prepared a little differently than I'm used to. Oh, I'm excited to see what this tastes like. Children particularly, below the age of about 12 are very influenced by their teachers as long as their teachers are someone that they care about, as long as they know their teachers care about them. They can have a great influence by modeling, trying new things, by modeling, oh, this is not a food that's a real favorite of mine, but I know it's very healthy and, and I'm gonna at least take a few bites and see what I think of it today. These kinds of attitudes that we can, can do if we're eating lunch with the children, if we're eating snack with the children, can have a tremendous influence. 
So I would suggest that there's three pieces that really should be considered. One is avoiding empty calories and having that be a school-wide policy. As I said, no candy, no soda pops, a pretty simple thing. Then use education to do the rest of it. Use education to help the children appreciate the children that have healthy things in their, their lunches and, and to kind of go in that direction along with your parent education. Second is to help the children to recognize the signals from their body, particularly body hunger. One reason I want empty calorie foods not in their environment is because those are the kinds of foods that people tend to eat even when they're not physically hungry. There's kind of a tendency to just go for those foods and to be attracted to them even when the body doesn't need fuel. So teach the children to recognize those signals and to follow them. And the last one is to have food be a joyful, let's share this, let's learn about it, let's learn about why the candy and the sugary foods aren't so good for us. Let's learn why we want vitamin rich foods and mineral rich foods. If it is a, a thing that we're going toward rather than something that we're going away from, I found that to be most successful. Now we have talked in other episodes about movement. For that reason, I'm just going to touch on that briefly here, but children in Montessori schools have got to be getting more movement than just getting up and choosing work. I know that in a lot of schools, they've cut down on the number of recesses because the children are able to move about the classroom more than they are in a conventional school setting, but this is not enough. We've got to have that large muscle movement. We've got to have several opportunities for that throughout the day, throughout the week for our children. Now the last piece that I want to touch on in this segment is setting up my guest segment. One of the things I had not realized until I spoke with the, the people at the Tooth Fairy Island Company um, at a Montessori convention in 2009, I had not realized how great a threat to our young children tooth decay is. I had not realized how great a threat dental diseases are to the health of our young children. I knew it was a problem for grown-ups. I knew, you know, gum disease was a big deal and all that. I knew it was a problem for dogs and their hearts, but I had not realized that this is one of the great, great medical problems, especially with our poorer children. So I'm going to encourage you, even if there's a few little fantasy elements in this next segment that, that turn you off a little bit, to pay attention to what's this information. And some of the materials they have are magnificent. The, the mouth puzzles, some of the things that don't have fantasy elements are very worthwhile to have in your classroom. And the last piece that I do want to mention is it was so interesting to talk with these people at this convention. They weren't familiar with Montessori. And as the Montessori people came up and talked to them about why we don't have a tooth with eyes and a smile. We don't have these fantasy elements for young children, especially ages three to six. They were so receptive. They were so welcoming to what should we put out on our table? What things would your, your people be interested in? And it was just one of the most marvelous conversations I had. So this is a little off topic of children's health, but be willing to share what you understand with the people who have coordinating interests. We all want children to have healthy mouths. <laughs> that's that's something that we shared together. So it was so such a good thing for me to realize that when we share our understanding of things, other people who maybe haven't even heard this or why we have these attitudes are so open. And so I hope that you will enjoy this next segment and do what you can to support overall health in the children in your community. selected curriculum for the National Children's Oral Health Foundation, and we were actually written for the Academy of General Dentistry to put into schools prior to them losing their funding. 
So six years ago, this company started itself, and we've been just bootstrapping it and bringing it forth on our own because we feel this needs to be done. What most people don't realize is that oral health or dental disease is the number one childhood disease in our nation. And as far as chronic diseases, it's five times more prevalent than asthma, it's three times more prevalent than obesity, and it is totally curable. It is the number one reason that children end up in the emergency room. It is all of our, it, it is necessary for all of us to teach oral health, not once a month in February or October when the sugar comes out for Halloween, but on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, we need that full responsibility. Many people feel that dentists should do this. There are only 5,000 pediatric dentists in our whole United States. We have 20 million children. We all have to take a responsibility to, to teach the children of our nation. So that's what this company is about, to make modular units that are easy to use, to pull out, and to be instantly available to teach. Our teachers find that these units are so simple to use. They're written at a fifth and sixth grade level. They're not a recipe. They're not a lesson plan. Everything comes in a box. Everything you need to use is right there for you. The only thing we don't ship to you is water. So if we have water or a sponge that needs to be used in a lesson, that's the only thing that you need to provide. We use science-based materials. We use electron microscope pictures. And we have all of our data has been checked by dentistry uh, specialists. We have an entire uh, committee at the Children's National Children's Oral Health Foundation, a scientific committee that has researched our materials. And we've also done field testing that has been reviewed by Harvard epidemiologist Chet Douglas. And we'll be writing a journal report on this very shortly. So I'd like to show you just a few of our materials. We have, as part of our materials, high quality wood puzzles. And one of the things in our puzzles that's really interesting is that this one has a hole in the very back. So not only talking about the pieces of or the parts of the mouth, but it also talks about you can talk to the children about not putting toys or things into their mouth so that they don't go to their body, that your mouth is a gateway to the body. So these puzzles are three layers deep. And you can talk about what lips do and how the gums nourish the teeth and how the gums, if they weren't the way they are, that our teeth would be all wiggly and we couldn't actually chew. You can talk about the taste buds on the tongue and how the cheeks expand so the food can move around. Your palate be solid and smooth so that your tongue can thrust the food down to the throat. And when you lift this off, that's where we have the word throat. And so that you can talk about the throat and what it how it channels to your stomach and keep your body healthy. We have another puzzle that is Mr. Tooth. And Mr. Tooth is holding a toothbrush. And when you take off the gums, you are now looking at the four hardest surfaces in your whole body. And it goes enamel, dentin, and bone. One, two, and three. And you can also talk to the children by moving down that the tooth is alive, it has a blood source, and the pulp is a bloody mass that is around the nerve and protects the nerve of the tooth. And then you can connect this to the fact that if the enamel is compromised on the tooth, that that, that infection can go down and go into the blood and, and harm the whole body. So you want your child to be empowered to understand why they need to brush their teeth, that this is something that takes care of their full body health. This is not just a, a something that you do, but they, they understand the principle of why they're doing this. Another lesson that we have is Mr. Tooth Puppet. And this puppet was designed to help the child understand what they can do when they eat foods. So we talk about Mr. Tooth having been to a birthday party. He's had green frosting. He's all covered with the frosting. And Mr. Tooth, can you talk to me? No, I can't. We personalize this so that you can understand the coats. He's coated with this frosting. How are we going to get this off? Many children will say brush the teeth. And that would be a good answer. But you know what? I never take a toothbrush to a birthday party, do you? So what can we do? Then you can teach the children about swishing with water and how the mouth is very par powerful. Putting water in the mouth and swishing it back and forth really hard can loosen up some of the food. How they can use their tongue, which is the strongest muscle in their whole body, to move around the teeth and move away food from the teeth. And then
they can take a napkin and actually wipe down their teeth or a tissue or a Kleenex and get the fuzzy feeling off their teeth. That keeps rid of the germs and the food until they can do more. So let's take off Mr. Tooth's first coat. Everything's sewed to the puppet so it doesn't have to move away. Oh, but he still has a coat on, so what can we do now? He's gone home. Now the child will say to you, brush the teeth, and that is correct. And with the toothbrush that we supply, you can talk about the crevices at the top and how they need to brush it correctly, how they need to go round and round, as well as up and down, fronts and the backs. And if you ask the child, do you need to see a dentist if you actually do a good job brushing your teeth and you do it every day like you're supposed to, and you floss, you can instruct on flossing, a lot of children will say no. Well, let's take a look. We still have a coat on. How does this one come off? And now you go back through your list. It doesn't come off with brushing. It doesn't come off with flossing. It doesn't come off with water, the tongue, or a tissue. How does this one come off? And you discuss visiting your dentist and how you need to go to your dentist because there's still a light coat that stays onto your tooth. And if you don't remove it, it actually turns yellow. And so your dentist has his, his special tools and his special toothpaste, and it actually tickles when he goes round and round with this tool. And many times the children have seen or know about the cleaning that a dentist does. And let's see what happens to Mr. Tooth. We all, he's now a happy tooth because he's clean, and he's ready to do all the eating that you need him to do. So this is a wonderful tool to use for the children and empower them on the different levels and why they need to see the dentist. Start talking about taking away the fear of seeing the dentist.